Hello, hello, and welcome back to Lawrence Plays Factorio Space Exploration with Crastorio 2. And I've got, we've done quite a lot of stuff this week. We've made some more progress with the, uh, with all of the, the glyphs on the, on the, uh, in the cartouches in the pyramids, and a little bit more incremental progress towards the puzzle. So I'll get onto that a bit later on. So no spoilers just yet, don't worry. But first, well, there's a few other things to have a look at, like Arcospheres, and there's, and we're also going to be taking a look at some resources this week as well, as usual. So let's get started by having a look at what's been going on with the Arcospheres since last time. Mike has once again been using the Deep Space Exploration Spaceship, that's this one here, to go out and go and, and go and gather the Arcospheres. And this one works quite well. It's got it's got some chests on board that hold important stuff, like the probe rocket launch silo thing, the uh, the actual rockets themselves, and so on. There's a few few bits and pieces in here that allow it to fly out, park up in an asteroid field, deploy the uh, deploy the launch silo, and fire off some uh, fire off rockets to go and get them. And so. He's flown from Kalidus, presumably via Fenestra, because these are all very, very long distances, over to Crystal Collective in order to get a few from there, to Haunted Hollows up here, and then all the way down to Pebbles down here, which is a slightly odd selection. Maybe he'd already done Asteroidia and Sands of Time. I, I don't remember for sure. But so he's picked up another three, and I believe he launched five Arcosphere Collectors in, in each one and got back about five Arcospheres from each one. So we've got an extra 15 of them, which is quite handy, because we've got to the point now where we're not getting quite as many from each launch as we originally did. Because whilst we can go out and get to the sort of the full pool from each individual asteroid field, we've de seriously depleted the overall pool, and that means that yeah, five launches typically you'll get about five arcospheres back, which isn't too bad, but is definitely nothing like as good as it used to be. Oh no, no, sorry, I checked the notes here. He says he got five from Crystal Collective, he got seven from Haunted Hollow, so he did well there, and he got six from Down on Pebbles, so an average of six from each one, which again, still, still definitely not too bad. And he would have gone out and done a lot more of them besides, um, presumably a lot with. A lot of flying via Fenestra because it seems like maybe he's done all the sort of the convenient clumps like this one up here and and here and so on and so now he's having to go out to ones that are a little bit further apart to pick off the, the, the final few. However unfortunately he's run out of the Arcosphere collectors which are made down here in the general sort of probe area and then flown over by bot over to the spaceship to take, to take them away. And the reason he's struggling with these is because we've run out of dynamic emitters. And I'm not sure where the dynamic emitters are being created, so let's search for those. Okay, it turns out those are being made over here in the, uh, and this is, this, this is the deep space science production facility. You can see we've got the Naquium coming in here and so on. So over here, we're, make, we're trying to make the dynamic emitters, but it, it's not working very well. There's something missing, and that something is the quantum processors. And we've seen problems related to this before. Now, I know where these ones are being made. If we zoom out a little bit and go over here to the energy science, these are, in theory, being made about here, yes, here. Uh, and as you can see, there's a bit of a shortage of, of some of the inputs, particularly the Holmium cables. And so those we are still having a bit of a struggle with. Despite all of the upgrades I made last time, we're still running into a few problems here. Uh, that said, when they do flood in, we, we, get, we get some coming out. And taking a look at the consumption production graph, we can see over the last hour, well, it's been rather dead, and this is when we had pro ho serious Holmium shortage problems. And then it's been a bit up and down, and I suspect each one of these spikes is when one of the trains arrives in up here and drops off an in entire train load of quantum processors, which can then flow through here and then come down this belt. And so, yeah, there's there's a there's a nice supply of them now, but, that's, that's, but it's already run out, and we've not even, well, I was going to say we've not even filled the belt up. That's not true, it's been flowing a bit, but yeah, we're still having some serious problems over here, just with, sh with the sheer throughput of these of these uh, Holmium cables in order to make the processors. And the reason we're struggling with the Holmium cables, at least the, one of the reasons we're struggling with Holmium cables, um, is because there's there are a couple of trains that are running from uh, over here, where they pick up the Holmium cables, uh, maybe down here, and they bring them over to the elevator system over here, so they're dropped off in one of these stations, where they'll then go into here to be brought up in the normal mixed trains to wherever they're needed. They're also brought all the way over here, to, and this is the uh, the secondary elevator area where they'll be dropped off. They'll go into a, pr a special train that's just for the Holmium cables. They'll take them up, and that that one just brings them over into to be used for making the quantum processors. And admittedly, a few of them might be taken for other things up in the energy science area. But in theory, this should bring plenty of Holmium cables from the production area over here, over drop them off here, and they'll go up up in the train. And in theory, we should have plenty of them being made. The problem is that it takes 32 Holmium cables to make each processor, and so. E the, even the throughput of the trains isn't really sufficient. 
I also wonder a little bit how the um, production of the cables is going. Now, if we look over here in this warehouse, we've still got about 480 stacks in here, and there's a train actively loading at the moment. So this was, last time I looked at it during the stream, this was at about 480 stacks then as well. So I think it looks like the supply up over here, the production of them in this area, is absolutely fine and is well able to keep up. The, uh, the two blue belts flowing in here steadily is enough to keep up with the, granted, eight, eight green belts coming out, but only when there's a train in here. So at the rate the train seems to come in to, to get more and then, and then head off to reload again, it seems to be absolutely fine. Now this train is showing destination full, which surprises me. Maybe there is already a train on its way over. Yes, there is already a train here unloading some Holmium cables. So those can flood down here, go in here, and then when the train comes back down again, it'll be ready to take some more up. Uh, this has, okay, it doesn't have a full train's worth in it, but it does look like the train was able to leave fairly recently. So maybe only having one train going from here is insufficient. And we're going to need to have a second train going from, well, a second copy of this train going from down here to take them up into space. And maybe even a second train bringing them, solidly bringing them over here. Both of those are they're kind of scary prospects because that's a lot of Holmium cables for us to be getting through. Now it is possible that this flurry of production over here is just us making enormous quantities of the Holmium processors and once it catches up and starts filling the buffers up, then maybe we'll be all right. Let's have a look for the other side as well. On the other side, well, there's a massive spike of consumption there. Let's let's skip over to 10 minutes to see if that helps at all. On, on the 10 minute range, okay, we're seeing 57, 58 being produced and only five and a half being used on average. So maybe, it's kind of hard to tell because there's a lot of things that aren't working at the moment, probably because we're just sort of putting the quantum processors into trains, which will then take them away and then they'll get they'll get used up in one place or another, but we haven't got enough to sort of properly supply everywhere yet, so we'll keep an eye on it, we'll see how it goes, but this number being bit so much bigger than this number is makes me cautiously optimistic, but because there are so many places that are just completely starved quantum processors at the moment, I do wonder if it's just that they're not being distributed properly at the moment, or that there aren't enough to be distributed properly yet. We'll have to definitely have to keep an eye on it. So this train system is, in theory, bringing them to wherever they're needed. It did stop for a little while because um, I hadn't thought of putting in a fueling stop over here and there wasn't one over here. So it meant that the train was rattling back and forth from picking them up over here and dropping them off over here and unfortunately ran out of fuel. So Tristan has fixed that by putting in a fueling system for the entire um, Holmium area. So we've got train dropping off fuel here. It's now able to fuel all of the trains. So that won't happen again. Unfortunately, he did leave the cables train on manual mode while he was waiting for it to fuel up. So that sort of caused a bit more of a, a pause in it which is probably why there's such a big gap along here. Uh, part of that, that might have contributed to that a little bit. Um, but now I've come in, I've set the train going again, so that's sorted that problem out. Yeah, the Holmium cable, as I say, does seem to be keeping up quite nicely. We seem to be producing enough of it. And if we look at the graph from Matron over here, we can see that we... Still, oh no, we've, we've run out of Holmium again. again. We've, you, we've brought it all down. This was looking really, really healthy because... Over on Njord, Tristan has in fact finished the new, the Mark III, Mark IV, I don't know, I don't know what number we're on at the moment, a uh, production area for Holmium ingots. And that's this area over here. Now this was all built last week, but I didn't manage to find it. And if we look on the map, I, you, you can't really see why, but uh, in my in my defence, there was previously an enormous Holmium area that was filling basically all of this space over here. Uh, and now, having put in speed modules and things, it's now got a lot smaller. It now is just, just this area here. And that's how I managed to miss it, because it's so much smaller. However, as you can see, this is now using sort of the more modern design principles. We've got wide area beacon twos, full of speed module sixes, uh, that's covering the entire area. And then we've got lots of, and then we've got productivity sixes going through here. We've got the advanced chemical plants, advanced furnaces, and lots and lots of speed modules in the casting machines as well. So all of this now runs really nice and quickly. And we, as you can see here, we've got a nice supply of holmium coming out the other side. One of the reasons it's doing well is because Tristan's also added in um, holmium ore processing. So we're bringing in ore along here from all of these uh, belts which I believe go off to mine. Yes, there we go. So there's a mine producing holmonite ore that comes along here, goes through, pass down here, and then into the into the processing facilities over here. So that should keep all of these, all the systems running nicely, even when we run out of course at fragments. Um, and over then over here, I believe this is dropping off more holmonite that's coming in by uh, by train. And I believe we also drop off the holmonite core fragments over 
Bleh here, probably, and they will then be passed through here, and that's what the systems up at the top are using. So you'll notice there's more crushers up here than there are down here, and that's because up here we can crush the core fragments and then crush the Holmanite. But that's running a bit slowly at the moment because we don't have enough core fragments coming in. And that's just because our, our demand for Holmium is so high that we can't dig up the core fragments fast enough. There, there, there aren't enough core themes on this planet. As you can see, Tristan has gone out to every single core seam on this planet, so it is being produced literally as fast as it possibly can be uh, without us doing more mining productivity research, admittedly. Uh, so that's why he's then having to top up with the, uh, with the mines down here and get that extra bit coming through. Now if we take a look at, again at the production graph, because this is a good way of getting an idea of how things are going, we can see that we produced 563 per minute uh, over the last hour and used 401 per minute. So that suggests to me that things are looking pretty good. If we look over the last 10 minutes, again uh, at this point the numbers are quite similar, so it's not quite so good, um, but it does feel like things are going pretty well. We've seen good amounts of Holmium over in, um, in, in, in Norvis. It just seems like at the time, at the specific time I looked, I think some of the buffers were empty. But the storage area down on Norvis is now as as it, it, it's not it's not full actually, um, and I don't think it's as full as it's meant to be because there's meant to be at least a train load in here. So you can see we we have enough on um, on Norvis to keep everything running. However, we haven't filled up the buffer in space yet, so that's a that's a very good sign. It means things are working. We just have a little bit more of buffer filling to do. So we'll get we'll get there fairly soon. And looking up in Njord bit, well, we can see there is a spaceship here. So, you know, it, it, it is gradually filling up. The trains are popping up. They're unloading into the in, into the spaceship. And the spaceship is maybe a third full, just under a third full. So it's going to be a while till it leaves. However, hopefully we'll have enough Holmium over on Norvis that it'll allow us to keep going until this next spaceship comes through. I will have to report back next time to see how it's gone. But things are looking... I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic at the moment. I guess potentially if we wanted the system to go a little bit quicker, then... I was going to say we could have some more mines. I don't think we could. Uh, the mines are all running. The, the, these systems, these belts are all full. I guess it would just be more copies of the um, of this of this system. So we could, we could copy this whole section, put in another block of it down here, and we could, then we get a bit more holmium coming out on the other side. But yeah, there seems to be easy enough holmanite coming in at the moment, um, although it's hard to tell because the, the belts are backed up. So yeah, maybe more. We'll see how it goes. This might actually be enough, but I don't want to say, I don't want to get too excited about it until I've seen the buffers filling up properly. Last week, I said that Tristan was going to need to add in some more hydrogen chloride production to go along with this system that he's got over here. Um, however, it turned out that due to the extra productivity modules running through here, it apparently is actually okay. And you can see here, yes, the pipe, the input pipe is basically full. So it turns out that if you use enough red modules, productivity modules in here, you can you can reduce the input of some of the uh, some of the weird products you need and just get have things working nicely even without having to boost the uh, the hydrogen chloride. So that's quite nice. No, oh, no, no. But he's then corrects himself again and said he'd added in some more production over here so that's this this area over here uh, there seems to be a bit of a shortage of stone coming in at the moment oh is this a little bit trickly yeah there's a little bit trickling in now on a on a yellow belt of all things uh, so that'll give it a little bit of a boost I don't know it seems to be working okay uh, we could potentially have a little bit more of it um, this tank isn't quite full these pipes aren't full but it's not too bad it's hanging on that's certainly not the problem with the uh, with the um, Holmium production at the moment of course, adding all of these uh, speed beacons in has meant that he's had to put in a load more power up in Njordbit. Uh, so this this solar field here is getting bigger and bigger basically every time we look at it. Um, it's need, it always needs more and more and more power. That's the problem with speed modules and productivity modules. You get loads of free stuff. You, have to, you don't have to use as many machines, which is great for UPS, great for module costs, great for everything except for power consumption. But fortunately, we seem to be able to make lots and lots of these solar panels. So that's not too bad, really, I guess. <laughs> Tristan has touched on the uh, the lack of stone coming through here as well. Um, he said that he's noticed that he's getting through quite a lot of it and he, he's worried that it might not be enough. So he's put in some more stone mines. Um, however, there's only another half a million left on this entire planet and that's not very much. So he might need to start shipping that out in the spaceships as well along with uh, anything else. Along with, I think, cryonite and probably possibly rare metals and anything else that's needed for the for this, for this system. Uh, that hopefully won't be too much of an issue. There's usually a decent amount of space in the spaceships when they come out, uh, but he's already churning through all of the stone that's produced by all of the processing that he's got, and it's, it's not really enough, so a little bit of a boost along there might be required. He also points out that he's ripped up this uh, area over here, which I, I, I mentioned that, uh, but that means he had, meant he had lots and lots of spare parts, some of which can go into making this system, and some of which maybe he'll ship back to, over to Norvis, especially some of the lower tier modules, and then we can upgrade them and turn them into something actually useful. 
The next thing I want to take a look at is going to be a continuation of how we're getting on with the, the Stargate and the pyramids and the so on puzzle. So um, if you don't want to be spoiled on any of that, then well, I'm afraid this episode is now over for you. And um, because I'm not going to talk about anything else after this, there's quite a lot to say. So it's going to take, take, take the entire rest of the episode. But please come back for the next one when I should be going on about uh, some much less spoilery stuff. So if you're still here, well, let's get stuck in. Mike has been continuing to explore the pyramids, so he's gone out to um, Asimus, which had uh, pyramids on Sparky and Picard, so both of those have now been uh, investigated and screenshotted, and he's nicked the modules, and he got a speed module and a productivity module, so those are both useful. So he's then also been up here to Electra and M Merlim, Merlime, however we want to pronounce that. And on Electra, there were two two planets on in this one. There was Chrysalis, Crystalis rather, and um, Hedoni, Hedone. And he's managed to get, again get pyramids on both of those. And that was another productivity module and another speed module. So again, very very useful, very valuable modules there. And finally, as I said, in Merlim, he's gone to uh, Jaegna, this one, and he only got an efficiency module from there. But again, all of these have now been screenshotted, and that means I've been able to add them to my diagram here, which is getting um, busier and busier. And so we've got the nice arrangement of the cartouches here, and I've put a little bit of effort into trying to get them into a, into a way that I can sort of link them all together. And there we go. That's how I've, that's how I've managed to draw the lines between them, and it's getting sort of to the limits of sanity now with this system. Um, but just in case you haven't seen the previous videos, these links here represent anywhere where the central glyph on a cartouche matches one of the edge glyphs on an adjacent one. So for example, if you go from um, Picard to Sparky, you can see that sort of leg-shaped thing in the middle of Picard it can also be seen in the top left of Sparky. And that applies to all of the links you can see over here. But as I say, it was starting to get a little bit weird and difficult and uh, and a bit messy. And so I switched over to an alternative way of, of displaying what, what, what we've been seeing. Uh, and this system, this is a, a, a random website that allows me to create these nodes and then I can sort of drag them around a little bit and they'll, they'll all sort of wibble pleasingly like this as, as we try and connect them to, as, as we connect them all together. And so you can see here, this is exactly the same image. This is exactly the same layout of all of the uh, all of the pyramids we've discovered all the cartouches all the glyphs um, but it's not showing all the ones around the edge around the outside edges of them it's just showing the central ones and then all and, and, the, and the links to, to put them together and then I've gone through and sort of arranged things a bit in in a way that seemed to make sense now I've then showed it to Tristan who um, who realized that actually this could take a little bit of tweaking we can we could arrange these so we don't have any crossovers in them so Ollie Rand could be stuck in the middle over here for example uh, Jaegner could then be put down here now the system doesn't really like this because it's in dynamic mode at the moment I can that over to static which will allow me to then arrange things uh, a bit more to my uh, to, to, as, as, as I wish to that and there we go and so now you can see that we're getting very much a sort of a 2d map of all how all of these uh, fit together uh, now we haven't managed to join the two sections of the, the two separate sections we've discovered together yet but we're starting to see a sort of a possible layout coming together that um, if my theory is correct is going to represent the way these things are sort of mapped over onto the onto the sphere around whatever the central point is. And so I think at some point this is going to stop really working because I'm going to be trying to represent uh, the uh, the surface of a sphere in 2D and also trying not to sort of connect things around the edge. So it's going to be, it's going to be like trying to represent um, the world on a flat map. And the only way we manage to do that is by cutting it down the sides and then unrolling it. Now we could do that and have some and then just have a note on the side that says where the links go across from one side to the other. That might be the best way to do it. We may have to go for a sort of a Mercator projection of this uh, of this whole system. Them. But at the moment, there's, we've explored a small enough amount of it that this kind of works. After I showed it to him, Tristan then pointed out that actually, in a way, I've sort of got quite a lot of this mirrored and the wrong way round. Because if you look at one of the uh, one of the cartouches, all of the glyphs go round it in a specific order. And so he went in and made some modifications, and this is now sort of lost, moved a certain bit, a certain way away from um, sanity, I think. So we might need to sort of rethink how we're going to display this. Because he's done two things here. Firstly, he's rearranged the uh, the glyphs to make them in the correct order. So as in, as in more or less in the order that they go round, the, uh, round each of the cartouches. He's also put in a lot of the unknown ones. So for example, we know from looking at the, uh, the sigils around the edges that Yegnar is connected to number 19, which is this funny shaped one. We know that Talos and Snek 
and Amadeo all have this thing uh, on, 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 their, on the edge of them. And so he's linked to that. He said that we know this is going to exist. We don't know what planet that's on, but we do know that it's going to exist. It's going to be about there, and it's going to be linked to all of these ones. And so from this, we can do a little bit of... Um, we can we can extend the diagram a little bit further and add in lots and lots of extra uh, things around here. And yeah, it sort of kind of... It sort of kind of works. It has at least managed to link the two parts together. So we've got to see Sparky and Sparky and Oliran are linked together via number fifty-one, for example, the, the headless chappy here. So yes, we can. So we can kind of make. We can kind of get, get a, a single unifying system here. And one of the things I've noticed about this, yes, it is a bit of a mess. But if you notice, this area in the middle is fairly dense, and then there's a couple of bits around the edges over here that have got some very very long lines where they're trying to join together. And this, I feel, also backs up my. This is mapping on a circle system. So across the middle here you've got sort of, I don't know, the Americas and Europe and Africa going around the equator. And then down here you've got Antarctica and one of the weird things about the Mercator projection is that Antarctica appears much much bigger on the map than it really is. And up here you've got Greenland as well. Uh, actually that, that might might be Alaska. But anyway, you, you see my point. Across the bottom here, these these two should actually be, or these four, should probably all be fairly close together around the bottom of the sphere. But because we're trying to stretch the whole thing out into two dimensions, it looks a bit stretched out and weird. And that probably means that maybe this this one over here should be joined to one that will then link up to something over here. So there's, there's, there must be another one between number 13 and number 41 over here. Uh, maybe there's more than one between them, I don't know. Although Tristan has said he's managed to get every single one onto the diagram. So, yeah, maybe if you pulled all of these in together, you'd have some sort of... You would actually get a full sphere. Oh, no, of course, no, we, no, that doesn't work. Because we, we if, if 13 was connected to directly to 41, we wouldn't know about it. Because we haven't explored either of those planets. So we don't know if around the edge of here is one of those glyphs. However, this does mean that every planet we have explored, like Picard or Znok or Oliran, now has all of the links coming off it. We've got all 11 links coming off Oliran here. We've got all 11 coming off Wyvern and so on. They're all... They're all fully linked up if we've explored them, but there are other ones where we don't know all of the things. Like over here, for example, number 31, Guy with a Sword, only has two links coming off it because we, we haven't explored it. We've only found two planets that, know it, that are linked up to that one. And so there is still a lot more exploration needed to be done before we can finish this diagram off, but we have produced a thing which is sort of, which is interesting and gives us some, um, gives us something, something to look at. For added entertainment, we've all, he's also done. He's also used the dynamic um, algorithm thing on the um, on the on the full version like that, and it's pulled them all in together like this. Uh, and this is it is now full wibble mode, so you can see as I drag Picard around, it's, it's nudging the other ones. Yeah, so this has now pulled them all in, which means you have a lot of overlapping lines, particularly in areas like this, and it looks like a bit of a mess. So I don't know if this is actually useful. But it's kind of fun to play with, so uh, it's, it's, it's useful from that point of view at least. <laughs> and now, back in game, well we've done a couple more of the long range star mapping researches, which means we've now got an extra couple of um, things at the bottom. We've got okay, his guy with sword and pie down the bottom here. So we've found coordinates for a couple more of these uh, constellations, or perhaps they're not coordinates, perhaps they're directions. It's kind of hard to tell because they are all unit vectors, we've done, we've done the maths on that. And so now we've actually found a few of these where we found the, uh, the the specific glyphs on the pyramids as well. The pie at the bottom here matches the glyph in the centre of Metapillar's um, cartouche. Hedoni has this sort of M-shaped thing up here. Picard is these leg things up here. And I think that's all we found. But the interesting thing about this is when we start to then sort of draw the comparisons between them. Because Metapillar and Hedoni are linked together. And if we look at their numbers, they're actually not that far apart. So we're seeing on the X, on, on, for X we've got 0.4 versus 0.3. On Y we've got 0.8 and 0.4. Okay, those are a bit different. And then on Z we've got 0.3 and 0.8, which again, a, a bit different. But they're all in sort of roughly the same area. And once again, I did the maths for this and I discovered that means Means they're 40 degrees apart on the sphere and I reckon that 40 degrees is close enough that if you had everything arranged about 40 degrees apart you'd be starting to get fairly close to the 60 um, patterns that we've discovered and if we take a closer look at Picard we can see that one of the exterior glyphs that we haven't actually explored yet so we don't know the name of this planet but one of the exterior glyphs has basically the same coordinates except that the Z has gone from minus 0.2 to plus 0.2 so again that's not very far that it turns out is only 24 degrees so some of the so the angles aren't constant between them however they do seem to be relatively small and if the if all of the um, the constellations are only 24 degrees apart then there's easily going to be room for 60 on a sphere 
Finally, uh, Tristan noticed that Picard and Metapillar share share two outer glyphs, um, but they're in fairly, but their directions are a little bit more distant. And I did the maths for that one as well. Those turn out to be 80 degrees apart. However, that's skipping across another one in between. So if it's 40 degrees per glyph at maximum, then 80 degrees between one between a pair that have a, another one in between them also makes a certain amount of sense. So all of this is coming together quite nicely to strongly imply that all the coordinates we're seeing here in the in the long range star mapping uh, are pointing out to the same graph that we're drawing in the uh, in the in the Wibblematron. Uh, that it, and when we stretch that over the sphere and get it, we'll be, we would in theory be able to plot all of those in the correct places. And I might need to find somebody who's good with 3D modeling because I'm not. And but it would be fun to produce that 3D model of where all of these things are. And then. I'm not quite sure what we, I'm still not sure what we're going to do with all this information and how it's relevant to the puzzle. However, it is all coming together to, to, to support the theory that we've got all these directions here and they point to the constellations and the constellations are all together on the outside of the sphere in the and, and, and they're all connected together by the glyphs that we're seeing on the cartouches. So there's some very interesting stuff going on here. I apologise if this has all been a bit numbery and not quite as factorio -y as you're as you're used to from my videos, but I think it's all looking quite interesting. And hope I'm hoping that as we get some more information together here, then we're going to be able to pull it all together. It'll make sense and it'll be useful. And it'll allow us to jump jump to some useful conclusions and go over and start programming the Stargate. I'm not 100% convinced we're going to be able to make the make the leap of logic from one to the other that easily. I think there's going to be quite a lot Lot more thought required but I do feel like we're heading in the right direction so I guess you'll just have to come back for uh, next week's videos to find out how we've been getting on with that where we'll have sent Mike off to some more uh, pyramids get some more get some more data we'll have tried to do more long-range star mapping that's actually the harder part at the moment because that requires crazy quantities of beryllium and we don't have very much of that at the moment but I'll be talking about that in the next video I think or maybe the one after depending on how much I took how much I end up talking about it about everything else so I think this is going to be quite a good place to make the cut. I've got a, a stri another stream to go off and get ready for, uh, to peek behind the curtain. I'm recording this on Wednesday just before I do the uh, satisfactory stream. So I'm not sure exactly what I'm going to be doing there, but come back on a future Wednesday when um, I'll be uh, carrying on with that. We'll hopefully have nuclear power up and running by then and to carry on trying to produce things for the space elevator. I will also, of course, be back on Monday to carry on with the uh, Factorio K2SE run, where we'll be doing a bit more thinking about this puzzle and then going out and trying to play with ArcoLink storage devices, more Naquium, more Beryllium, just more of everything because the factory is very, very hungry and it, it always is. There's always more science to be done. There'll also be some more videos over the weekend. We'll see whether it's one or two. I think it's probably going to be two at this point, if I'm being honest with you. <laughs> and of course, there'll be some more next weekend as well. So make sure you subscribe so you don't miss out on any of that. Thank you very much for watching and I shall see you next time. Bye bye.